Well, let me say this as we get into the uh, message. If you say, uh, Pastor, I'm hearing some things a little bit differently now than I have before. Well, we have a brand new uh, system that's been installed this week and uh, uh, tremendous appreciation to uh, Hamlin and Kersey and Andy Kersey for uh, installing it. And uh, you're hearing some uh, music. Maybe you've not heard or maybe you heard it a little bit louder uh, because they've just done a wonderful, wonderful job. I told Kenneth and Daryl and they sound good. And of course, I didn't get to Mona, but it just sounds wonderful. Well, let me invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to a number of passages this morning. Because we're in our series on the reliability of the Bible. You go to church and preacher opens this book and preaches out of it. But if there's any time that you're hearing attacks uh, about this uh, book, we're hearing more and more. People are saying, well, you know, that's uh, just what somebody wrote uh, some years ago. And how do you know that it's uh, really all that true? How do you know that it's all that reliable? After all, a bunch of men wrote that. that and after all, isn't the Bible just... Uh, chog full of errors, and you know, there's all sorts of mistakes, and so uh, how do I know that this book is reliable? Well, a lot of people are asking that question, and first of all, let me just say this. The Creator never gives us a right to call Him into question, but what He does do, He gives us wonderful evidence that we can just be reaffirmed over and over and over again of the authenticity of His Word. I want to read just a number of passages, and Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, and uh, just a number of verses, and then 2 Timothy chapter 3, and Matthew 24, and then 2 Peter 1, because I just wanted to give you what God says about His Word. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the Word of our God shall stand forever. Then, if you'll turn to 2 Timothy, that's Isaiah speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, saying, and by the way, he was a thousand years 1,500 years before the birth of Christ. And, uh, you know, here's what he said. This word is going to remain constant. Well, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Then Matthew chapter uh, 24, if you'll turn there. Turn back to the Gospel of Matthew. Look at verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. And then 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now when you read that one last verse, that really answers what people are saying. Well, you know, it's just written by a bunch of men. Well, Peter said 2,000 years ago, that, uh, and, and God knew that that was going to be, he said, you know, they were used, God used people in their own culture, in their own disposition, in their own nationality, but he said they were moved along. In other words, God's Spirit moved them along and gave them what to write. But I, I want you to uh, follow along with me in your outline because there's a, there's a growing uh, lack of confidence in the Word of God, uh, unlike any other time in history. Someone shared with me not too long ago, said, you know, people just don't read the Bible anymore. And uh, while that may be true with a lot of people, there are some that are still reading it. You find it new and fresh every day. Now, what I'm giving you this morning is not to try to convince you because, can I tell you this? I cannot use science. I cannot use data. I cannot use all of that and convince you without the Holy Spirit convincing you in your soul. Amen? You remember when you was convicted of sin, of judgment, and of righteousness? Nobody convicted you of that but the Spirit of the living God. And nobody pointed out that you needed Jesus apart from the Spirit of God. So there is nothing I can do to convince you, but here's what. I want you to understand the fresh and the new. If you're not in the Bible, I pray that this series will get you to go back to the Bible with a new fervor, a renewed interest, a renewed zeal, and just read this precious book. Why? Because it's a compass for life. It's God's love book to you and me, and it will guide you in every aspect of life. One of the things that I've noticed through my many years of reading the Bible is this. There is not a place in the Bible but what you can find an answer to absolutely everything you face in your life. I mean, it's there because it's superseded by God of Scripture. But I want you to follow along in your outline because I just want to reorient you to the truths uh, last week that I shared. And, and there's a number of truths that I shared with you last week. I'm not going to elaborate on them 
But I do want to remind you of them. First of all, we can believe the Bible is reliable because of the claims of Christ. When you get into the New Testament, you find this person by the name of Jesus Christ being mentioned time and time again. And here's what he says about himself. He claims himself to be the same as God the Father. He said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, you've got to ask this question. Either Jesus is who he says he is, or he's a lunatic, or he's a liar. You see, if a person is a lunatic, they believe themselves to be something that they're not because, you know, just because of some, some things they've said about themselves. They believe themselves. Other people, even in Jesus' day, call themselves a Messiah. And uh, if he's a lunatic, then the reality of it is that all the claims are not, are not feasible. You can, you can reduce them down to, well, that's just what he said. But do you know, when you go back to the Old Testament, there are 48 prophecies specifically pointing to Jesus Christ coming. He said he's going to be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2. He's going to be born of a virgin, Isaiah chapter 7. And on and on and on it goes. So how in the world could 48 prophecies specifically about Jesus, his birth, where he's going to be born, and other things about how he's going to die in Psalms chapter 22, verse 16? How in the world did they know that? Because the Bible says they were moved by the Spirit of the living God. And you find Christ... And 48 prophecies fulfilled. Listen, that is, someone did uh, statistics on that. If For 48 prophecies to be fulfilled of a singular person to happen the way it did, it's one in seven trillion, according to this statistician. So first of all, we can believe the Bible because of the claims of Christ. Second of all, you can believe the Bible's reliable because it claims to be from God. You know, over 1,900 times, you'll find this book claims to be from God. Now think about this for just a moment. If God of the universe allowed somebody to write this book and they claim to be of God and claim to be written, don't you think he would crush it in its infancy? Don't you think he would stop it? Listen, you find thus saith the Lord many times, better than 500 times in, uh, in the first five books, better than 1,500 times in the Old Testament, and it would just stand to reason that the God of the universe would crush a book like this simply because... If, if it wasn't what he said it was. But it is the Word of God. It is reliable. And third of all, we can believe the Bible because of the evidence fulfilled by prophecy. Now, prophecy is a proclamation of things that are going to come that only the Creator of the universe will know about. For example, Noah preached about a coming flood 120 years before it happened. The Bible and science reveal that there has been a cataclysmic flood. If you want to find out where Noah's Ark is, you can Google it. It's sitting on Mount Ararat. Nobody can get to it. Nobody can touch it. It's there, and God put it there, and it will stay there until he decrees otherwise. Not only that, but you think about it. God told Daniel, and I believe it was chapter uh, 2, verse 40-something, uh, that uh, you know, there was going to come an empire. And that empire was going to be ruled by an individual, and we know him now as Alexander the Great. Well, do you know that Alexander the Great, God prophesied through Daniel about Alexander the Great hundreds and hundreds of years before he came on the scene? And so, you know, God uh, made that very clear. David prophesied about the crucifixion. Now get this, folks. David prophesied about the crucifixion 500 years before the crucifixion was invented by the Persians. You see, David proph er, prophesied about the crucifixion in Psalms chapter 22, I believe it is, in verse 16. How did he know about the crucifixion? He didn't know about the crucifixion. He had never known what a crucifixion was. But you know, it came on the scenes, and he spoke about it hundreds of years. Fulfilled prophecy. Isaiah predicted the coming of Christ, you know, 500 years before Christ came to this world. How did Isaiah know it? Because God told him. God told him what to write, what to pen. Now think about it. Jesus declared the city of Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. And sure enough, in A.D. 70, it was destroyed. How did Jesus know that? Because he said, I am God. I am the Father of one. And you know what that means? Listen, you can take this book to the bank that whatever it says about past, present, or future is going to be a reality. Get this. And I just, I just happened to Google this and, and look this up. You remember Jesus commented, and he talked about as time grows closer and closer to the end, there are going to be more and more earthquakes in diverse places. You're going to see it. You're going to hear it. You're going to know about it. I want you to hold on. 
to your hats. I just Google it using the U.S. Geological Survey, which measures earthquakes, the number of them, the, the size of them. I want you to, just to get some idea. From 1974 to 2003, here's the number of earthquakes per state. Alaska has the most at 12,053. California, 4,895. Hawaii, 1,533. Nevada, 778. Washington, 424. Idaho, 404. Wyoming, 217. Kentucky's had 15. Now, how does, how does God know that? How does, how, does Jesus, how does the Bible say that and it's going to happen? How does this man named Jesus say it and it's going to take place? Because he's more than a man. He is the son of the living God. He is the one who you're going to stand before someday. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning the end. And that's why you can take this book to the bank. Fourth of all, you know, the Bible's reliable because it's the power of God to change lives. I shared with you last week, but most of all, the power of your own changed life. What is it that you've done in life that's changed your life? You've never bought a pair of shoes that changed your life. You have never watched a ball game that changed your life. Now, I've seen some pretty exciting ball games. But you've never seen a ball game that changed your life. You've never read Reader's Digest that said, you know what, I've read the Reader's Digest and my life has changed. What is there that changes your life? You open this book, and as you open this book, it convicts you of sin, of judgment, of righteousness, like Carla Tucker, as I shared last week. She was in the middle of a jail cell, and she opened this book, and she got on her knees, and she realized that she was a sinner before holy God. Guilty of an axe murder in 1998, she was executed. But before she was executed, she came to faith in Christ. Why? Because there's something about this book. Why is there something about it? Because this is the authoritative book from holy God to you and me. It's the book for your life and for your living. It's the book that tells you what's awaiting you after life. There's a lot of people who say, well, you know, there's, there can't be just one authoritative source. There's got to be all sorts of authorities. Now think about it for a moment. If you run a business and owned a business, wouldn't you like for there to be five people who had the same responsibility as you and you'd be the boss, you'd be the owner? No, you say, if I own it, I'm going to run it and I'm going to have the say-so. Listen, that's what God does. He owns this world, he runs this world, and he has the eternal say-so. He is the sovereign of the world. And that's why when you open this book, you don't ever have to wonder. Well, you know, does he really mean what he says? Yes, he does. He means exactly what he says. And I love what he says through prayer. I prayed a prayer last Thursday, and I'm watching to see how it's answered. I've connected with a couple of people, and I said, pray this with me. And they're watching. You know why? Because listen to what he says. Ask, and you'll receive. Now, I want to just maybe some of you are weak in faith right now. How many of you have asked for something specific, and you have received something specific? And I mean not only is it was a little thing, it was a big thing. Raise your hand. About every one of us. And when I said that, I couldn't help but think Heather's list. Heather's list of a man. She came and said, I, can I pray for a husband? And I said, yes, you can. And she put down the list. Heather, did you get what you prayed for? And she's got one of the trophies in her arm, sleeping through the preacher's message. How there? But listen, he is a God who says, I can depend it on. Take me to the bank. Trust in me. Rely on me. And listen, that's what he wants you to understand. And it's reliable because of the unity of the authors. You remember I shared with you that uh, this book was written on two continents, written in three languages, penned by 40 men over 1,500 years. Now, I want you to think about how illogical that was. Let's suppose that I just get a number. I say, you know what? I'm going to start writing a book, and I hope somebody else writes a part of it down the road, and I hope in years to come that it'll be put together and people will, it'll change people's lives. First of all, you don't have that power. Nobody has that power. God moved in the writing of, of Genesis. God moved Moses to write. God told Moses what to write. And God told him how the world began. Listen, I love the fact that we have a God who speaks to us. We have a God who communicates with us. Listen, whoever God is, it's what he's always been. He's always been a personal God. Amen? Listen, he didn't save you long distance. He saved you locally. You invited him into your life. He saved your soul and you became a Christian. You turned to him. You repented of your sins. But this morning I want to share with you briefly three other proofs, three other proofs that reveal God's word. First of all, the Bible is God's word and reliable. 
because it has a message for all time and all generations. Now, I want you to stop and think about this for just a moment. The earliest recorded writings of Scripture, you go back and it was in the Mesopotamian uh, era. It was in, back when, you know, mankind began. And you have Adam and Eve. God created them out of, God created uh, Adam and then took a, ri a rib and created Eve. And, and you go back and you read the book of Genesis. That dates back about 4,000 years. How many of you are reading another book in your life that was written 4,000 years ago that is absolutely changing your life? I love to read Genesis 37 through 50. I'm not going to tell you what it's about. I'm just going to give I love to read the person in there because of probably of anybody in the Bible, he's gone through everything. If you'll read Genesis 37 through 50, you say, what is it? Get into it and read. But think about it. You've got people who we couldn't understand their dialect, their language, their tongue. But you go all the way back, and, and it, their lives were changed. And uh, you go back 2,000 years, and you've got the early church. The people spoke in Greek. Now, if I ask you, can you say anything in Greek? But the only thing I know is ego amote. And don't ask me what that means. It is a good word, but I can't remember the translation of it. But the reality of it is this book transcends humanity. Why is it that you read it and your life is changed? Why? Because, listen, the Bible says the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Listen, when you think about it, it causes you to bow before God. It causes you to search your soul. It causes you to ask yourself serious questions. Am I, am I walking with this God? And the interesting thing about the Bible is this. You'll find all sorts of behaviors in the Bible. You'll find adultery in the Bible. You'll find incest in the Bible. You'll find people who are doing all sorts of abominable things. But you won't find this in a house of ill repute. You won't find this in, in places where they want to live godly because it's convicting to every one of us. It convicts, the Bible says, to the very marrow of our being. It convicts us because when you open it up and God speaks to you, you know that it's the God of the universe. You know that He has a message for you. You know... I've read a lot of books in my life. I've been in a lot of classes in my life. But I've never come across a single book that has, is, and is continually changing my life like this book. I love to get into it every day. I love to open it up. And uh, as I said early in the morning, read uh, my copy of the Scripture and let the Lord speak to my soul and my spirit. Why? Because it is. It's alive. It's active. That's why a lot of people who... You know, when they read this book, they say, you know, I can't get away from this. This is telling me this about my life. Because that's what God does. He never leaves you the same. Think about it for a moment. Every person is going to have an eternity someplace. How do you know that? Do you realize you wouldn't know anything about eternity if God didn't tell you? If God didn't program you and let you know? How do I know there's been a, there is a heaven? I've never been there. How do I know there's a hell? I've never been there. I know it because of the Word of God and also because of my soul. Do you remember when you placed your faith in Jesus Christ and you walked down the aisle or you repented in some bedroom, bathroom, or wherever you was, and you invited Christ into your heart? You knew that you were saved. You knew that you was going to go to heaven. Why did you know that? Because you took God at His Word. Let me ask you a question, and you're the best proof. How many of you now, we don't like the dying process. I'm not too happy about that. If I could choose my way, I'd say rapture first. And then if I had a second choice, now I don't want to scare you. Please don't let this scare you, okay? And if this happens, know it's the desire of my heart. I'm not teasing you. The second way I'd love to go is to die of a massive heart attack preaching the gospel. They say, thanks a lot, Pastor. I needed that. But think about it. Preaching to you and then be present with the Lord. Now, I don't know if my wife knows that. I'm sure she does. But think about it. All of a sudden, you're here, second, you're with the Lord. Now, why do you know that? Because there's a peace that resonates in your soul. You have a peace in your heart. You have a peace in your spirit. But number, number eight, the Bible is God's word and reliable because of its honesty. Think about this for just a moment. All throughout the Bible, you find the Bible speaking very honest about people's behavior. Let me give you an example. Jonah talks about how he runs from God. How many of you want to tell how you run from God? David tells how he committed adultery 
with Bathsheba. The Bible gives his prayer in Psalm 51. When you read this book, you know, you, you find all sorts of people talking about their, their lives. And here's the thing about it. Man always wants to put himself in the best light. We never want to put ourselves down. What person would write this book about himself, putting himself down, telling himself, and telling everybody that unless you repent, you're going to go to a place called hell? Man wouldn't write this if he could. Neither would he write it if he would. Because he don't want to think about an eternal retribution. When I talk to people that don't want to repent, they don't want me to talk about hell. And friend, if you're here and you don't want to repent, you don't want me to talk about hell. You don't want me to talk about a place you're going to live for all of eternity. But unless you repent, you're going to perish. Unless you turn to faith in Jesus Christ, you're going to live for all of eternity with the devil, with the demons. You're going to live all of eternity with the Hitlers and the Stalins. You're going to live for all of eternity with the Mussolinis. You're going to live for all of eternity in a place the Bible says is of outer darkness. And the truth about it is what man would write about an eternal existence like that? No man would. We always want to talk about the best. We always want to talk about what we can get because we're selfish, we're self-centered. You see, you look at your life and how many of you live in a hut? How many have said, you know what, I hate this air conditioning. I don't, I don't, I don't want myself to enjoy it. I'm going to get rid of my air conditioning car. I'm going to get rid of my air conditioning house. I'm going to get rid of all of my luxuries because I'm just not going to live that way. No, what we say is bring it on. Now, here's my point. The flesh loves to cater to the flesh. Mankind don't want to talk about negatives. Listen to the average person. Listen to the average feel-good preacher. The average feel-good preacher never talks about accountability or judgment or hell or retribution. They'll talk about name it, claim it, get it. Why? Because there's a fallen nature inside of us. But listen, you read this book, and it speaks soberly and honestly. You find in the early book, you find Noah's found naked by his sons, and they walked in backwards to clothing. You'll find Lot committing incest with his daughters. His daughters got him, they got pregnant by their dad. Who would write a book about like that? And you see, think about it for just a moment. People say, well, you know, that, that book's a child full of errors. Find me one. You say, well, I'm not, I know some people have found errors. Let me ask you a question. Why isn't there on the national news tonight, or why has it ever been, that people have said, you know what, we have found the Bible is untrue, and everybody needs to throw their Bible away because it is written completely by man, and you cannot count on your Bible anymore. You know why? Because... That is absolutely a lie straight out of hell. Amen? I remember some years ago, and I was just a kid, and he scared the living daylights out of me. On the CBS Evening News, Walter Cronkite came on, and he said, God is dead. Do you remember that? Do you remember people were carrying around signs? God is dead. God is dead. God is dead. I'll tell you what. Their God is dead. Mine's very much alive. And he's in heaven. He's ruling the world. He's my Father. He hears and answers prayer. He is the God of the universe. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's the one that says, Son, I'm going to come and get you someday. I'm going to bring you up hither and let you see what I've had in store for you all along. You'll get to live for a certain number of years, and then I'm going to let you either be raptured, I'm going to let you die. But even at death, I'm going to bring you home, and I'm going to let you see this paradise that I've had in store for you for all the ages. Amen? That's my God. That's the God of Scripture. That's the God who says, you know what? I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. I'm never going to abandon you. And you listen, when you have some of the most difficult challenges in your life and difficult moments in your life, and you have a million questions in your soul, you can hear him whisper to your soul, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to go away. I'm not going to depart from you. That's simply who I am. I am your God. I love what Isaiah said, the way he couches it. Isaiah chapter 40 says, I am your God. Think about it. You see, I am Stephanie's dad. I am my wife's husband. And we had a celebration yesterday of some birthdays. and We was talking about a certain type of 
ice cream. And Stephanie just looks at, oh man, that'd be so good. Well, we couldn't find that type of ice cream. It's Butterfinger ice cream, by the way, if you want to know. And I asked her, I said, well, what other kind would you like? Don't worry about it. I'm a daddy. Now, she didn't ask me for anything. And I said uh, to my son-in-law, I said, let's go over to Dairy Queen. Went over to Dairy Queen. I just didn't get a little piece of a cake or a little piece of, little thing of ice cream. I bought a Butterfinger cake. That burger thing was $24.95. <laughs> I took it home, and we ate about four slices out of it, all of us, and 75% of it, they froze. But then I got to thinking. She didn't ask me for it. She didn't say, Dad, would you get me a cake? She just said, don't worry about it, Dad. I'm fine. But you know what Dad did? And I love this. I like, Dad said, let's go, son-in-law. we got a Dairy Queen run. Listen, now here's what I want you to understand. We've got a Father in heaven that says, you know what? I know what you need. And it's already on its way from heaven. You've not begged me for it. You're trying to walk right. You're trying to walk holy. You're trying to make a difference in your world. And it's already on its way. The answer's already on its way. And I bring it to your life. God said to Heather some years ago, Heather, your answer's on its way. And his name is Byron Cummins. And to that union, I'm going to give you two precious children. Maybe five more. Maybe seven. No. We'll leave that between them and the Lord. But I know that both of them would say, Hallelujah, thank you, Lord. And listen, that's what our God says. I want you to prove me and test me. I want you to test me in the reality of life. Don't you worry about defending God. Don't you worry about asking too much of God. You just say, Lord, here's my request. You get on your knees before the Father. You get humble before the Lord. And you ask Him. And He'll hear and He'll answer. You know, you can also tell the Bible's reliable because here's the thing about it. Ungodly people don't want to listen to the Bible unless they're under conviction. or You know, there's, there's a point that people are living in the world and walking in the world, and here's what they're saying. I don't want this book. Why? Because it does something to your soul. I know what it is to run from God. I know what it is to run and find yourself away from the Lord and away from walking with the Lord and, and have that inner misery. But you know what? Here's the wonderful thing about it. Even when you're ungodly and walking ungodly, there's the love of God to forgive you and to cleanse you and to make you right with Him. Amen? Think about it. Name what you could do before God. Say, Lord, what if I commit a murder? Carla Tucker would say, you know what? I did commit murder, but I found a God who forgave me. What about a person who's living a homosexual lifestyle? which is an abomination before God. He'll find a God that will forgive him, cleanse him, wash him, and make him or her clean before him, if they're serious with God. Amen? Because we have a God in heaven who loves us. And then lastly, the Bible's God's word because of the practical test of experience. I've already shared that. But there have been so many times in your life and mine that we said, Lord... I don't know what to do, I don't know what to pray, I don't know what to ask. But here's what I am asking. And you know, you find it in the overflow of experience. You find it in the overflow of life where you're praying for your children, your grandchildren, and you watch God at work in their life. And the practical test of experience where, where you say, you know what, I'm concerned about this in my life, and, and God hears and He moves and He answers. You know... David said, what time I'm afraid, I'll trust in the Lord. But then he said it a different way. I'll just trust in the Lord and not be afraid. Think about it. Now get this. This, is, this gets exciting. Whoever God has been, he is and will always be for all of eternity. Because he says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Either he's impersonal and he's always been impersonal, or he's personal. And he'll always be personal. You know what he's proven? Moses, raise your rod. So you've never seen a sea split? Watch the hand of the Lord. Raise the rod, the wind dried the ground, and the children of Israel saw the power of God in their lives. They worshiped God. 
and listen. That's who your God is and my God is. That's why we need to make very clear that, clear that our, our God is not a fabricated God in, in our thinking of our mind. There's a lot of people who have a fabrication of a God. I don't believe God would punish evil. I don't believe God would send a person to hell. That's a fabricated God in the mind of people. The God of the Bible has always been for all of eternity. He's not asking you what he, he's like. He is the God of Scripture. And the thing about it is, He has more wonder in store for your life than you could ever imagine, think, or believe. And here's what He says. Call unto me, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Let me give you some rest. You see, He knows we get weary. Think about this for a moment. Saints of God, won't you be glad someday you're never going to see another sin, experience another sin? You're never going to see another negative moment after we leave this world and go to heaven. Amen? You're never going to have a bad day. This is the best heaven for the unbeliever. This is the best life we'll ever get. There's someone who wrote a book, Your Best Life Now. And I agree with exactly what uh, Dr. John MacArthur said. This is only your best life now if you're going to hell. You know what? I'm not going because someone paid my way. He paid in the price of blood and he gave his life for my wickedness and my sin. He said, Benny, unless you repent, you'll perish. I repented of my sin. I said, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know if I die, I'd go straight to hell. But I said, Lord Jesus, come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Nobody told me they ever questioned the Bible, but here's what I proved as a seven, eight-year-old little boy. I proved Romans 10, 13 true. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be what? So, have you ever wondered what being saved is saved from? Someday the wrath of God is coming on this earth. Someday the fury of God is going to be vented on this earth. And he's going to destroy it with the might of his hand. But you see, he can't do that to you or me if you're a child of God. He's got to take us home first. Friend, you're here and you say, well, you know, I, I've got a lot of people around my life that they question the Bible. But in truth, if you just think about it, how is it a book that spans 4,500 years written by 14 or 40 different men? And you know what? It's a book that expresses the love of God to you and me. You know, the worst thing that I ever did in my life when it comes to Christianity, I read this book only as rules and regulations and in all of that. You do that and you'll close this Bible real quick. But when you read this Bible knowing there's a God in heaven who loves you. There's a God in heaven who wants to hear and answer your prayer if you'll pray. Pray believing. Pray asking. Pray getting specific. He'll show you wonders you never could have imagined if you'll ask him. And most of all, he'll save you if you're lost. Friend, if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, here's what the God of the Bible says. I'm not going to hurt your feelings, but I am going to love you enough to tell you the truth. Unless you repent, you'll perish. And can I tell you this? There are some good church members in hell. There are some people who joined the church, and they were regular church members. But they died and went to hell. They picked up a songbook and they sang the song. But if I went all throughout this sanctuary and I ask you this question, do you know that you know that you know that you know you're saved? Can every one of you say yes? Can every one of you say yes? Can those of you who I know I'm saved? Testimony from a friend of mine shared with me Friday. So Benny, she was one of the best teachers in our Sunday school class. She was faithful to the church. There was no doubt, but she loved the church. 
But she, on one of the messages I was preaching, shared this pastor. She walked down the aisle and she said, you know what? I could not say I know that I know that I know I'm going to heaven. Friend, I preach to every one of you every week, but I want to ask every one of you this question. Do you know that you know that you know you're saved? Or do you just give a little bit of lip service and you're hoping that what you've got will get you to heaven? Man, eternity's a long time to be wrong. And Father, we thank you so much.